You see, um, black people in the U.S., they organize it and they are going to the streets and they are putting fire to the buildings, etc. And in Brazil, we are all, we are all quiet. It's a huge lie. Hmm. Black, black movements in Brazil have never had the possibility to stay quiet, you know? Mm-hmm. I wish we could stay quiet, but we can't. And we have never been quiet, so people have been struggling in different ways. Hey! <laughs> How are you? I'm fine, and you? Good, tudo bom? Tudo bem, tô feliz de te encontrar. <laughs> feliz. E aí? Let me know how you're going to make it like in English, Portuguese, <laughs> how you're going to organize it. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, it's funny because Elio <laughs> speaks, obviously he speaks English as he's speaking right now, and I, I speak Portuguese, so our conversations tend to be bilingual. And so we're thinking about having a bilingual conversation where I, I speak in English and Elio speaks in his first language, Portuguese. Um, but we can just play it out by ear, yeah. Let's see how it works. Let's see. Let's do it. So good. Como vai? How are you? Eu tô bem. Uh, esse é um momento difícil aqui no Brasil. A gente está vivendo uh, um momento muito delicado, sabe? De muita violência política, uh, um cenário sanitário da saúde muito difícil, muita gente morrendo, hum. sobretudo gente negra, gente pobre. É, eu estou em São Paulo agora, eu estou em quarentena na minha casa. A gente segue em isolamento, sem previsão de quando vai terminar, porque a situação no Brasil ainda está muito difícil, delicada. Mas, a parte disso, eu vou bem. Pessoalmente, eu vou bem. Ótimo. Como você está? I'm good. Yeah. Well, first, I want to maybe translate a little bit of what you said. Um, well, Elio was saying that he's um, in São Paulo. I'm still in quarantine and that it's a very difficult time in Brazil right now. One, on a level of health, um, people, like the cases of COVID in Brazil are mounting, are increasing. And also just politically, Brazil is kind of in an unstable situation with the current president, Bolsonaro, who's crazy, to say the least. <laughs> Not to say fascist. <laughs> Exactly, because he's 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 a fascist, but very very much akin to Trump. Yeah, yeah. but I personally, I, I personally think that Bolsonaro is worse than Trump, because at least Trump is seen by the whole world. You know, you have mm-hmm. ways of showing what he's doing; people know it. But here in Brazil, it's way less noticed. It's way less known than mm-hmm. what is happening in the U.S. So. Uh, crazy people here feel free even more than there, I guess, to make stupid things, but, well. That's a good point. Yeah, I feel like more people know about Trump's just craziness, whereas, yeah. like, Bolsonaro is, is, is less well-known, so he can get away with more. Yeah, he has yeah. more support in a lot of ways. Like, Trump is an unpopular president here. I mean, he, he has his fans, but in general, he's an unpopular president. Yes, so. Bolsonaro is getting quite really popular now. He's, he's around like 30% of people that still support him. Mm. But 30% is like, it's too much. It's tough. Right. Exactly. So, well, I guess I should say how I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm chilling. I'm, <laughs> I'm, <doing my, laughs> I'm, I'm just chilling in Brooklyn, doing my thing. So, yeah. I mean, I'm, I like you. I'm a, I'm a little worried about the political situation here in the States. I'm not happy with the, the continued murder of black people, which is also happening in Brazil. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later in the conversation. Sure. Um, and also, you know, I'm still in quarantine too, um, in my apartment. So yeah, we're, we're dealing with similar situations, but in different parts of the world. At least we can, we, we can connect and talk here, so. Exactly, yeah, yeah. we've been empowered by the internet. It opens new possibilities for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, so I would, I would actually love for you to describe where you're from, where you were raised, your upbringing, your, where you studied. Take us to the, the beginning. Bom, vou falar em português. Sou Hélio. Eu sou 
filho de Sônia e Hélio. Eu sou neto de José, Tereza, Marlene e outro Hélio. Então, eu sou o terceiro Hélio de uma família baiana da cidade de Salvador, que fica no nordeste do Brasil. É uma cidade e um estado, a Bahia, da onde eu vim, é muito negro. Um estado muito marcadamente africanizado. Né? Foi um dos portos que mais recebeu pessoas escravizadas da África no período colonial. E isso se mantém ainda hoje muito forte nos deuses que nós cultuamos, nas comidas que nós comemos. Então eu venho de uma família, de uma cidade, muito ligada às religiões afro-brasileiras, aos costumes, às roupas de origem afro-brasileira. E mudei para São Paulo, no sudeste do Brasil, aos 18 anos de idade. Eu vim estudar, fazer faculdade, e aqui levo já 15 anos... É, morando em São Paulo, me formei antropólogo, trabalho como curador de arte contemporânea do Centro Cultural São Paulo, que é um aparelho público, uma instituição de cultura aqui da cidade. But I said to me in Portuguese, it's going to be quite difficult for you to translate, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 this is perfect, yeah. Um, it won't be hard to translate. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I can try to make it. Let's see how this, how, 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 how it goes. Oh no, that int introduction was beautiful. Yeah, um, Elio said that he's from the state of Bahia, which is in the northeast of Bahia. He's the third Elio in his family, and his family is is black and sort of grounded in Bahia's um, Afro-Brazilian culture, and Bahia. Uh, for those who don't know, it's very much um, a state that's grounded in the history of slavery in Black culture. Um, it's, it's still very much a Black state. Um, but at um, age 18, he moved to Sao Paulo, where he studied, and he's been there for 15 years. And he currently works as a curator. Um, he studied anthropology, sorry, um, in, at university. And now he works as a curator at the um, Sao Paulo Cultural Center. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, can you, how can you get it all in your mind? Incredible. Oh, no. <laughs> no, it wasn't hard at all. Yeah, and, you know, I have to say, I love that you're from Bahia. Some of my favorite people in the world are from Bahia. It's such a special place. And I feel like, unlike other people, I feel like where you're from plays a big part in your professional life. If that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite sure. I mean, if I wasn't born and raised there, I wouldn't be who I am, for sure. Yeah. So it would change completely the way I look at things, the way as I think of things. So, of course, it changes the way I work and the subjects I'm interested, etc. So, for sure, being uh, born there, it's like something that changes and shapes the way I I see it and the things I do, for sure. Yeah. Where are you from? I am from a state that's very similar to Bahia, um, Louisiana. Ah, is, I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Baton Rouge, um, which is, it, it's, I often compare it to Bahia. It's a very black state. It has its own unique culture. Um, and, you know, it's, it has a carnival, very similar to Bahia and, and, and Brazil, so. Yeah, born and raised in Baton Rouge, and I moved to New York. Similar to you when I was 18. Yeah, wow. we have a similar trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> you studied anthropology, and now you're working as a curator. Um, so tell us, um, who are some of your favorite artists currently? Essa é uma pergunta tão difícil. O risco é sempre grande de deixar algumas pessoas de fora. E... Artistas que eu admiro muito. Olha, se eu tivesse que escolher um artista que... Nossa, que difícil. Olha, olha que responsabilidade. <risos> Mas se eu tivesse que escolher um artista é, que me atravessa, que me fascina, é, sem dúvida seria o Arthur Bispo do Rosário. <risos> o Arthur Bispo do Rosário é, de longe, meu artista 
preferido. É um... Eu não conheci em vida, pessoalmente, e tenho, alimento um sonho de nossas conversas, né? É... Acho o Bispo do Rosário incrível. Mas, atualmente, há muitos artistas, sobretudo artistas brasileiros que eu tenho acompanhado, com quem eu tenho trabalhado, é... que são incríveis e que têm feito uma revisão da história da arte brasileira, tem feito uma revisão dos, da historiografia brasileira. É, são, sobretudo, artistas negros, negras, artistas de diferentes partes do Brasil que têm realizado obras em é, suportes, interesses, temas que têm remexido a história da, coloni da colonização, que têm politizado de maneira é, deliberada seus próprios trabalhos, né? E tem, com isso, feito, trazido um respiro novo à arte contemporânea que tem sido fundamental no Brasil. São nomes como Aline Mota, Juliana dos Santos, Jaime Laureano, a J. Mombassa, No Martins, a, puxa, Silverino Oju, a, sem contar outros nomes que já vêm a, de uma geração um pouquinho anterior à nossa, mas ainda muito ativas e muito produtivas, como Rosana Paulino, a rainha Rosana Paulino, hum. Eustáquio Neves, Sônia Gomes. Bom, se eu continuar a lista aqui, Lídia Lisboa, a gente vai passar a tarde inteira falando <risos> de artistas incríveis. É, ainda, infelizmente, alguns deles pouco conhecidos no Brasil, por hum. conta de uma estrutura racista, é, que invisibiliza a produção de artistas afro-brasileiros, artistas negros é, do Brasil ou estrangeiros que aqui residem e que aqui estão alocados, vivendo, mas que são artistas incríveis. So, Elio gave a, a long list of Afro-Brazilian artists. <laughs> And I, 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 I can't remember all of them, but there are two that stick out to me. Um, the first is, um, and I'm going to mispronounce it, o Opispo, can you say it again? Opispo. Bispo do Rosário. Amazing artist. It's interesting, you, you mentioned he's a textile artist. Yes. And, 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 yes. And, yes. And, and, you know, you don't consider yourself a fashion scholar, but in a lot of ways, I think of you as being a fashion scholar. Um, and he, he's not considered a textile artist per se, but he is a no. textile artist. Uh, he's, sure, put, yeah. he's, put, he's put into the, the folk artist category because he wasn't classically yours. trained. Ah, uh, yes. Oh my gosh. Wow. Bispo do Rosario, he was, um, ele foi diagnosticado, diagnosed as a, um, com problema mental, psíquico. E foi internado à força, né, à revelia, numa instituição total, uh, psiquiátrica, a qual uhum. ele foi submetido a muitas torturas. Uh, e ele, ainda assim, uma das vias de escape, uma das vias de criação dele, foi pela o que ele chamava de catalogar o mundo, uhum. listar as coisas do mundo. E muitas vezes as obras textas do bispo sobretudo aquelas com linha azul, como essa que eu te mostrei, hum. é, por vezes ele conseguia a linha desfiando a própria roupa, desfri, des, desfiando, retirando os fios, descosturando é, o material de tecido na, dentro do hospício é, e recosturando para fazer as suas obras. É extraordinário. O bispo é extraordinário. He really is. And um, just to like translate what you said, um, this artist was diagnosed um, and was institutionalized uh, for, for a significant chunk of his life. And he wasn't classically trained as an artist, but he sort of found, used his own clothes and other textiles that he found and made it into art. And one of, central to his practice was cataloging or listing the world. So he created this, these extraordinary textiles with his own hands, just made from found objects and from his own clothes. 
so he's a, he's an he's an amazing artist so if definitely look him up when you get a chance another artist that you mentioned earlier in your response um and that i'm whose work i'm very much familiar with is hosanna polino who's an who's an amazing oh my gosh um brazilian artist um, in the height of her career right now in brazil but more people need to know more about her um i actually included two of her works in an exhibition that i um curated at harvard um, about slavery um, but Hosanna Polino is, is, is amazing. We have a common artist like, working. <laughs> How would you describe her practice, Hosanna Polino? How do I describe her practice? Is yeah, because that... it's, it's, she does a lot of different things. It's not just... Ela, ela, é, uma artista que, que, ela é uma artista muito versátil, em que ela, em realidade... É ela tem uma pesquisa muito consolidada, né? sobretudo sobre o que ela vem investigando das classificações das pessoas, da flora e da fauna numa certa história colonial brasileira. Né? A Rosana tem um interesse muito grande na biologia. Ela tem um início de estudos também na sua carreira na biologia. De modo que ela vai utilizar-se de suportes como o tecido, por vezes ela vai utilizar-se da escultura, outras vezes do desenho, da colagem, diferentes técnicas, porque ela é um artista muito preciosista com a técnica que escolhe, mas eu diria que o trabalho dela é sobretudo guiado por uma inquietação, uma pergunta. E a forma como essa pergunta vai se materializar vem numa segunda etapa. Né? A Rosana é uma artista pesquisadora, de modo que isso permite a ela fazer experimentações em vídeo e uma série de outras materialidades. Mas ela é uma artista que, ao mesmo tempo, é pesquisadora, é professora, é, é muito ativa no debate público. né? Ela escreve bastante, se posiciona politicamente. Então, ela é uma artista total, nesse sentido, né? uma artista orgânica. Uhum. Yeah, so right now we're talking about an artist named Hosanna Polino, and Elio said that she's a, um, a total artist, a total artist in that she has a very diverse practice. Um, she writes a lot, but also she has a like a, a creative practice, and she, she uses collage, she uses paintings, um, she uses mixed media, but... Um, she's very much interested in the flora and fauna of Brazil and biology. And actually, the, the pieces that I included in my show um, were um, she Exactly, exactly. Um, she reimagined the work of Louis Agassiz, who was this Harvard professor in scientific racist. And she um, sort of reimagined and took images, like these these very racist images of like, Black people and Native Americans, and sort of reimagined them and like changed the the orientation of them. So we 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 love Hosanna Paulino. <laughs> she's the queen. She's the queen. She's the queen. Hey, the queen. <laughs> <laughs> and she's also such a great person. You know, like personally speaking, she's so kind, and she is like a kind of teacher or a master of many young artists and young curators and young critics critics in Brazil. So my generation is, uh, most of us, uh, is somehow involved in Rosanna's network, you know, because she's mm -hmm. someone that is always putting people together and discussing and receiving people in the in, in her house, in her studio. Mm -hmm. So you, she's always like cooking and so she's this, this great artist. Oh my gosh. Wow. You know a question I have for you? Um, mm. It's about fashion, because one thing I, I wondered is like, does does Brazil have fashion exhibitions, or do you know of any um, young black fashion designers that should be on our radars, or not just fashion designers, but maybe even textile artists? Muito. <laughs> uh, <laughs> podemos passar muito tempo também conversando sobre o cenário absolutamente inovador e muito vivo. É, de produção de moda, produção têxtil é, brasileira, sobretudo de jovens artistas negros e negras. Hum. Ah, o Silverino Oju, de quem eu comentei agora há pouco, é um ótimo exemplo. 
Eu penso muito no Isaac Silva, por exemplo, um jovem estilista baiano, hoje radicado é, em São Paulo e dono de coleções incríveis, tem vestido... O Isaac Silva tem sido responsável por vestir basicamente todas as celebridades negras do Brasil, políticos e políticas negras, é, justamente pela produção sofisticada né? é, que, ele, que, ele, que ele faz. É, Goya, em Salvador, é uma produção tão conhecida, inclusive com alguma circulação é, internacional, são muitos. E esse é uma, essa é uma área é, que tem ainda encontrado alguma dificuldade nos espaços expositivos é, aqui no Brasil. Já foi muito mais comum né, exposições de moda em décadas passadas, nos anos 80, né? É, do que hoje em dia, mas é um movimento que tem é, se retomado. No Centro Cultural São Paulo, onde eu trabalho, é, um, ele é dirigido pela Érica Palomino, que é uma jornalista especialista em moda. E a Érica, é, ao assumir a direção do Centro Cultural São Paulo e me, me, e me convidar para integrar é, a equipe curatorial, abriu, é, a, reabriu a curadoria de moda que era uma curadoria que não existia no Centro Cultural. Então, ela criou é, esse espaço justamente para é, abrigar e ter um espaço cultural público é, em que tivessem... Tem, e como, como temos desfiles de moda, exposições de moda, debates sobre moda. É, então, esse é um cenário que tem, sim, começado a aparecer forte no Brasil. Great. Yeah, I'm just going to translate what you said. Um, I'm going to start from the end and work my way to the beginning, but you said that where you work at the um, Sao Paulo Cultural Center, um, the director is Erica Palomino, and she's a journalist and fashion scholar, and she um, was very instrumental in opening a space for the study of fashion and for the exhibition of fashion. So it's something that's um, in development, um, at least in your institution. But then before you, you, you did that, you, you, you gave a number of um, important um, Afro-Brazilian designers who are currently making works. Um, you mentioned Silvarino Oju, uh, and you also mentioned um, Isaac Silva. Yes. I think was one. And you also mentioned someone else who I'm forgetting. But all that to say is that there are a number of Afro-Brazilian designers and textile artists who are creating works, and it's an area that's developing and also needs our support. Uh, if I can also add one thing about that, is like, for example, um, Existem muitos artistas é, brasileiros que talvez não sejam exatamente uh, com o mundo da moda, mas que são artistas que lidam com o tecido e Sim. com estamparias nas suas formulações é, criativas também. Sim. Eu penso o caso uh, de uma uh, Lídia Lisboa ou do J. Cunha é, de Salvador. J. Cunha foi esse artista durante mais de 30 anos, foi responsável pela identidade visual do Bloco Afro Ileaie, que é um bloco de carnaval fundado nos anos 70, é, o primeiro bloco afro é, do Brasil. E durante 30 anos, o, o J. Cunha foi responsável por vestir milhares de associados negros que se reúnem no Bloco Ileaie durante o carnaval nas ruas em Salvador. É, ora... Essa, esses tecidos é, que o J. Cunha fez e continua a fazer durante tanto tempo são verdadeiras obras de arte, impecáveis, e que foram também utilizadas para vestimenta, o que eu chamaria, sem a menor dúvida, de uma grande performance coletiva que envolve moda, envolve artes visuais, música, ocupação do espaço público, política, ou seja, a moda está atravessando, né? É, todas essas produções, sobretudo de origem negra no Brasil, sobre o qual não dá para falar de qualquer produção estética negra sem falar de uma preocupação correlata com a moda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, uh, just to translate your response, you said that there it's not just Afro-Brazilian designers that are important, there are also artists who work primarily with textiles that we should also include in the conversation. And you mentioned an artist named Lydia Lisboa, but you also focused on another artist named Jota Cunha. 
who I have to be honest, I hadn't heard of until we until we talked. <laughs> but I, I looked up his work, and he's amazing. He's so amazing. Jota Cunha is could easily be placed in the costume designer category. Uh, he he creates the the clothing. Oh, beautiful! Oh my gosh, <laughs> he creates the clothing for um, Ileaye, which is a parading crew for Carnival. And um, so some people might consider him a costume designer, but his practice is, is, is wide and encompassing. So, um, yeah, thank you for including those two um, artists in the conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah, so c can you tell me, do you have any new projects or any expositions or any, anything that's in the works that we should be aware of? Uh... Sim, temos muito trabalho. <risos> uh, tem alguns projetos que eu estou, nesse momento, é, montando. Alguns projetos que já estavam prontos antes da quarentena nos atravessar. Uh, e que estão esperando pela condição de se realizarem fisicamente no espaço. Então, em especial no Centro Cultural São Paulo, uh, estamos à frente de dois processos de exposição muito bonitos. É uma exposição que eu venho uh, construindo que se chama Abre Caminho. É uma exposição uh, que reúne uma dezena, um pouco mais de uma dezena de artistas uh, contemporâneos brasileiros, afro-brasileiros de toda a região do país, todas as regiões do país. Uh, e é um projeto que... Ou de boa parte das regiões do país E é um projeto que toma a rua a, O espaço público O caminhar como uma forma de exibição hum. Tomando Exu Que é um deus de origem africana Muito cultuado aqui no Brasil Pelas populações negras Exu é o conceito que guia Essa exposição Que não vai acontecer num lugar fechado Ela é hum. para acontecer caminhando né? hum. E uma um outro projeto Também para o Centro Cultural São Paulo que é de um programa de exposições, é um edital público que há 30 anos existe e nesse ano uh, vamos expor 18 artistas que a partir de uma lista uh, que recebemos com cerca de 800 inscrições. Então foi um processo muito bonito com artistas de todo, toda a região do, do Brasil. E por fim, uma terceira exposição que eu ainda estou uh, trabalhando, uh, em colaboração, parceria incrível com uma curadora chamada Raquel Barreto, do Rio de Janeiro, sobre a vida e a obra da escritora Carolina Maria de Jesus. Ooh. Yes. Um, but who, who, are, who are some of the artists who are going to be in Abre Caminhos? Uh, some of the artists are like Yuri Cruz, uh, mm. um jovem artista do Rio de Janeiro, Moisés Patrício, Mônica Ventura, Val Souza, Alex Igbo, Coletivo Encruzilhada, Eduardo Barbosa, tem muita gente. Nice. Beautiful. And then there's a second exhibition that you mentioned. Um, and it also includes a, a long list of incredible artists who are going to be part of it. And then, let's see, the third exhibition you mentioned, um, let's see. I'm forgetting it's the deep. The, it's going to be on the writer. <laughs> on the writer yes. Called Carolina Maria de Jesus. Uh, she's she's known in the U.S. by a book uh, that was translated called Child of the Dark. Uh, in Portuguese, it's called Quarto de Despejo. It's quite different. There, there's nothing no, nothing to nothing to see one title with the other. Uh, mm. the, the, the original one in the English translation. But yeah, she's more known in the U.S. by this book called Child of the Dark. She's amazing. She is amazing. It's a book that I, the first time I read it, I was in college. I read the translation. Ah. in college and it's if I, if I understand the story correctly she she's a, a afro-brazilian woman who lived in a favela in sao paulo and uh, a journalist met her and found her writings and started publishing her writings she was exploited to a certain extent if i understand correctly um but she 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 had some level of um success and fame in her lifetime um And I think people are starting to rediscover her work. Yeah. So are you going to do an, uh, uh, a show that focuses on her life and work? 
Exactly. And, and you're this partnering. Is, oh, sorry. This is no, no, no. Please go on. Oh, you're part. You're partnering with a, another curator named Raquel. Raquel Barreto. Barreto. She, yeah, she's um. Uh, ela é uma historiadora, curadora, historiadora do Rio de Janeiro, um, e estamos juntas nessa pesquisa sobre Carolina. Essa história que você conta é a história mais contada sobre Carolina, mas não necessariamente a sua história verdadeira. Hum. Uh, ou pelo menos a maneira de contá-la. Uh, observe que é muito comum a narrativa, uh, e a culpa não é tua, é muito comum a narrativa de ela, Carolina foi uma mulher, uh, uma artista, uma, uma mulher afro-brasileira, que morou numa favela, escreveu, foi encontrada por um jornalista e teve um certo sucesso editorial. Eu convidaria todo mundo a olhar Carolina por um outra por um outro viés, entender que Carolina foi uma escritora brasileira que passou parte da sua vida, mas não toda, morando é, numa favela. Ela tinha um projeto editorial e literário muito grande que foi frustrado pelo racismo institucional, pelo machismo institucional, de modo que quando um jornalista a encontrou na favela, ela já tinha muitos, muitos manuscritos, muitos cadernos escritos, e foi ela quem o descobriu, não ele a ela. Ela hum. quem vai atrás dele, hum. ela quem consegue, por essa via, que ele publique o livro. Então, é preciso que a gente entenda a agência da própria escritora, que, aliás, conseguiu se publicar 20 anos antes do jornalista chegar, o que é uma hum. prova que ela tinha um projeto editorial de longa data. Hum. A gente encontrou algumas publicações de Carolina anteriores ao lançamento do suposto primeiro livro dela, que ela já hum. tinha sido publicado há algum tempo. né? Mas tudo isso não está colocado na história que a gente conhece sobre Carolina, mas estará na exposição sobre ela. Oh, that's awesome. And, and thank you for the intervention. Um, so Elio just corrected me. So I gave the, a very traditional standard narrative of Carol, Catalina. It's not your um, fault. <laughs> it's not. Right, yeah. But I, I think what you said was really important. Um, and it's an important intervention. Like we have to give Carolina agency. She was publishing before just journal, journalists found her. Um, um, one thing that Elio said is that they found her writings 20 years prior to this journalist supposedly discovering her. And it wasn't necessarily that the journalist discovered Carolina, but Carolina went after him. So she had agency in the situation and she got her work published by this journalist. So, he's, so Elio sort of like flipped the script, changed the narrative a little bit, sort of, we need to rethink um, about, think, rethink the career of Carolina because it wasn't so much that this journalist came in and discovered Catalina, but Catalina sort of was actively publishing prior to meeting this journalist. And um, it was only one step in the long career of her life. Great. Awesome. So th those are, those are three <laughs> amazing shows. I, look, I hope to be able to see at least one of them in person. Uh, it should be my <laughs> honor. <laughs> Let's talk about the current political moment. Because um, I, I think it's it's something that's we're both thinking about right now, and I, I wonder. I mean, it's self-explanatory in a lot of ways, but how? In what ways is your work a form of activism? Uh, eu diria que o meu trabalho tem uma relação ativista no sentido, uh, eu diria que tem e não tem uma dimensão ativista. Vou começar pelo não tem. Uh, eu diria que meu trabalho não tem uma dimensão ativista na dimensão que se entende primeiro sobre o termo, uh, porque eu trabalho sobretudo com artistas uh, que têm artistas e pesquisadores que têm se debruçado por tornar as histórias e as artes mais diversas, mais plurais, em termos de conteúdo, em termos de interesse, de forma, de inovações de linguagens. Portanto, são artistas que uh, 
uh, e produções que não deveriam ser vistas como necessariamente ativistas, mas apenas obras de arte que uh, e elaborações estéticas, elaborações de pensamento que estão disputando narrativas como quaisquer outras. É, e é claro que isso toma uma dimensão ativista, porque vivemos num mundo, eu vivo num país estruturalmente racista, estruturalmente excludente, que faz questão de deixar de fora dos espaços expositivos, de fora dos livros didáticos, de fora dos jornais, a produção rica, diversificada, de pensadores, artistas, intelectuais, negros e negras, afro-brasileiros. Ora, uh, mas quando eu digo que essa dimensão ativista é, é e não é parte do meu trabalho, né, se expressa e não se expressa no meu trabalho, é porque eu acho que também, quando as instituições ou outros curadores, críticos, não se debruçam sobre essas produções e continuam insistindo em realizar exposições de arte europeia, de arte branca norte-americana, ah, se essas instituições, os livros didáticos, continuam insistindo em selecionar apenas o ponto de vista branco ou majoritariamente ponto de vista branco, eles também estão sendo ativistas para a causa deles. Então, eu não gosto de... Eu acho que é importante a gente entender que tudo nesse, nesse mundo, todo nesse aspecto é político. E não apenas a nossa prática a artística, curatorial, é política, é ativista. A deles também é, mas é uma política conservadora. Então, no momento em que a gente entende que o nosso trabalho, e pelo menos eu gosto de entender assim, se insere nessa chave, eu diria que ele, sem dúvida, é ativista. Porque ele está lutando e ele engessa o cor, engrossa o couro é, de uma reivindicação do mundo das artes e do pensamento mais diverso, mais plural. Mas ele não é, mas não apenas esse tipo de trabalho é ativista ou político. Os demais também são. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna try to translate that. <laughs> uh, so, um, Elio's response to my question was yes and no. Um, he's saying that you know any curator or any person working in a cultural institution to a certain extent is an activist and that it's not just necessarily um, curators who are coming from the perspective of um, diversifying the art world who are necessarily activists, but any person working in the cultural realm is an activist. Would you say that's a, a good summary of what you said? Yeah, it's like when they are organizing like Uh, those people, the, those curators and intellectuals that not describe themselves as political and describe themselves as technical. Mm. Uh, I'm questioning this definition mm. because when they choose uh, to curate uh, always or, or almost always only white artists or European perspectives Uh, they are also being political. Mm. They are uh, choosing, they are making technical or they are not being activists in their conservative politics. They are being activists, mm. but not for the sense that we are fighting for. But mm. this, is, this is something that I think is quite important for us to have in mind because uh, it's very important to see that uh, the way we are um, addressing our point of views on arts, on politics, on culture, of course it's, it's political, but we cannot forget that on the other side, it's political as well. They are not technical and we are political because we can end up in a kind of um, uh, trap uh, describing ourselves as political, engaged, activists, and this can be somehow reversed as if you were saying that they are not political, they are not mm. they are technical, they are neutral, they are etc, etc, etc. So, It, I think it's always important to say yes and no 
to that question. Is that kind of approach political? Yes, for sure. But, and then you have to ask, but what kind of approach is not political? That's great. Like in, in here in the States, there's, there's a phrase that's been going around lately, like museums are not neutral. Um, they're never neutral. So I think one, the, point, the point that you're trying to make is that, yeah. you know, it's not just you and me and people who are part of the movement who are political, but everything that happens in the cultural space is political. And, and that's an important statement to make because like you said, like you get end up, you end up in this, this very futile argument in which one side is political and the other side is apolitical. And so they end up looking like neutral or apolitical or the standard and everything else is like radical or an intervention, yeah. but both are interventions. And you have to start off by understanding that everything's political and that things that happen in a cultural space, uh, a museum is always political in some respect. So this all to say that, yes, my work is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I want to talk about, I think this is really important with this conversation. Um, I often call them trans diasporic conversations. <laughs> two people from different parts of the diaspora in conversation with each other. I think it's really important because I think different parts of the diaspora need to learn from each other in different ways. And so I'm wondering, what can, how can I phrase this question? What can a Black American or someone who's, who's more sort of couched in the experience of being Black in the U.S. learn from the Black experience in Brazil or vice versa? Because you spent a lot of time in the U.S., so you've, you've experienced being a Black person in the U.S., and you've studied, you know, the dynamics in the U.S., so you have some familiarity with it. But also, vice versa, I mean, being a Black person born and raised in Brazil, like, what can you teach a Black American about race? Or vice versa. Uh, for a long time, it's been said that there is a huge difference between... Uh, the racial relations in Brazil, US, and South Africa. It's always like the three, in France sometimes, like the four models, right? Mm. Of thinking race. So there is an American model, a Brazilian model, a South African model, a French model, etc. Of course, there are huge differences between the context that, um, uh, where racism is demonstrated here in Brazil and there in the US. But I think that at the same time, this narrative that points out our differences that exist for sure, uh, somehow it can shadow um, the similarities which are really extensive. Because, I mean, let us think about, for example, um, police violence against um, black people. Mm. Uh, as in here, as in the US, most of people that are being shot by the police, most of the people that are being uh, persecuted and tortured by the police are black, male, young men. So, I mean, it's like, What's the difference between us happening here and in the U.S. in this sense? At the same time, I'm always thinking about as also cultural movements, black cultural movements in Brazil have always been connected to cultural movements all over the diaspora, not only the U.S., but uh, what's been, uh, for, for example, people in Cuba are listening to Olodum in Bahia. Who, uh, in Bahia, uh, Olodum is listening to Bob Marley, which is listening to West African musicians. And so, you know, it has always been connected. Uh, we can see it by our researchers, for example. Mm. The things that you research somehow and quite always uh, contact the things I am studying, I am researching, because we mm. are... Here in Brazil and you there in, in the U.S., sometimes we find common interests because it's a, there is a common story as well. So uh, it's hard to say, like, what, what can I learn from or what can I teach? Because it's a, 
really a process like uh you know from there to here and from here to there and but some things uh i see like of differences that maybe can be could be useful for us to learn from each other and, and with each other um for example you were just talking about uh, my hair like some minutes mm -hmm. ago and i do think maybe i'm wrong but i do think that the debate on the hair politics in brazil is somehow more advanced uh on the debate on the hair politics in the in the us like you can see in the last 10 years like here in brazil how black women and black men has shifted the way uh we are uh, dealing with our our own hair and using it very aesthetically and politically and in a in a sense that i still don't see it but maybe i'm just being blind uh in that extension in the us on the other hand there are so many big differences between us um that for example um there is a uh, brazil 56% of Brazilian population is self declared as black. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes a huge difference when you see around 15% of the American population uh, self describe it as African American. Uh, but even if we have that difference of uh, population, um, relatively popular, uh, relative population, uh, our how to say it in in english a uh, pb our oh my god uh, the measure of the wealth of the country i don't know how to say it oh um wealth disparity mm, not exactly that but well um what 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 i'm trying to say that the inequalities in brazil are way more profound and bigger than inequality than the inequalities in the us and it's racially based So um, this difference of um, population, but also this difference of uh, access to um, schools, to cultural centers, to education, etc., etc., uh, makes it possible that in the U.S. Um, uh, during the 20th century, in the beginning of that that century, now you. Uh, have uh, Beyonce's, you also had like uh, Obama and different uh, big names with all the problems that is involved, that are involved with those big names, but not even that we have in Brazil with this kind of projection, you know? So uh, I think that the only way of learning with each other is like doing what we're doing now and what we've been doing, talking and, and, and seeing that there is no American model that is completely different of the Brazilian model. No, 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 because we have, uh, even if the contexts are quite different, we can find common ways of resisting, mm. you know, mm -hmm. of resistance. We can find common ways uh, uh, on how to deal with that. And, and when we see here in Brazil, ways you are doing there in your manifestations, in the streets, which is kind of, kind of quite different of what's happening here, Uh, I think we can learn, mm. you know, on how to be that organized in the streets. And also maybe you can also learn with us on how to uh, resist, uh, even when facing a uh, um, historic, uh, violent um, police and violent repression against black organizations. I feel like Brazil, and in particular by... Uh has a stronger connection to Africa. And there's historical reasons for that, which I won't even get, get into. You know, I have a PhD in history, so I can, I can go on forever about it, but this, the connection- yeah, because, because you live it in Brazil. So tell me, tell me what do you think that uh, we could learn with the American uh, situation and this versa? Because you also have an experience here, right? So I, 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 I just wanted to, 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 think, to know what you think about that question that you posed me. Absolutely. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's so many commonalities between the U.S. and Brazil. And I mean, that's why I was interested in studying Brazil, because I, I saw so many connections to my experience just by looking at Brazil. One, it's a large country, just like the U.S. It's huge. 
wealthy country. There's a lot of money in Brazil. There's a lot of money in the U.S., but the way it's distributed is unequal. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of po- actually a lot of poverty in the U.S. and there's a there's a definitely a lot of poverty in Brazil, but there's also a lot of wealth. There's some very extremely wealthy people um, in, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. and Brazil. So there's high wealth disparities, um, but also like the history of slavery, like. Brazil, as well as the U.S., has centuries-long history of slavery, and I feel like all those things make for some, like some very like common experiences. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot that we we could learn from each other. One th- one thing I think I want to emphasize, you said about it being a conversation, it's a dialogue. So it's not that the movimiento negro is only inspired by African Americans and they're they're mimicking or copying what African Americans are doing. I've heard that before or I've, I've seen scholars. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, it's it's a racist reflect it's a, a racist way of um analyzing the black movements in Brazil. Because you know, there is something that people are are, are saying a lot, um, bullshit these days, like saying, you see, um black people in the US, they organize it and they are going to the streets and they are putting fire to the beauties, etc. And in Brazil, we are all we are all quiet. It's a huge lie. Hmm. Black black movements in Brazil have never had the possibility to stay quiet. You know, mm-hmm. I wish we could stay quiet, but we can't, and we have never been quiet. So people have been struggling in different ways. Like I do think that the repression. I know the repression in the U.S. is huge and it's strong and it's hard. But my brother, the repression here in Brazil is something so violent, but so violent that really you are discussing now in the U.S. Is our democracy running now? Is our democracy like uh, falling apart? And here in Brazil, it's like democracy? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So the repression here is so, so, so strong that it's hard to measure like um, the the involvement of um, um, uh, black movement now uh, only taking into consideration being in the streets or not, because there are other ways of uh, making resistance, you know? And this, this is, so this is a huge lie uh, because it doesn't reflect uh, properly the history of black movements in Brazil. Um, we're just saying like, we have a common, a kind of common story between the US and Brazil when you think about slavery. Uh, But uh, it's also, I think it's also necessary to to stress up that we have a common story about resistances to slavery. Mm. Because Mm -hmm. like like in the US, like in Brazil, since the very first slave ship arrived in our beaches, uh, there has been resistance. So how can someone say just now, oh, you've been quiet? We have never been quiet. Not, mm. not before, not now. Um, and also this idea that like here in Brazil, uh, as if you were always looking um, to learn from the US experience. Yes, but not only. That's the point. We are looking mm-hmm. at you, but we are looking uh, to um, Cuba. We are looking at uh, Senegal. We are looking at different parts of the world. And you are looking at us as well. Mm-hmm. So let's stop uh, pretending that it's o- a only one way um, uh, conversation because it's not, this has never been. This is white bullshit to confuse us because mm-hmm. in the practice, we know that we are learning from each other and you are still learning from each other, even if they are saying that we are not doing that. That's a beautiful response. Isn't it? <laughs> but, we actually, I mean, I just want to say thank you for setting time aside for this conversation. You know, I'm a big fan of your work. I haven't, I hadn't had the opportunity to see one of your shows in person, but I've been following your work for a long time, and it's just an honor and a pleasure to be in conversation with you. So, oh, it's my honor and pleasure, really. If, if I if I have like two minutes, so I'll say like because uh, I just uh, the beginning of this year before quarantine and everything. Like I organized my first exhibition uh, in the U.S., so I'm very happy and quite proud because it happened. Like, um, it was an it's an exhibition called "The Discovery of What It Means to Be Brazilian," mm-hmm. uh, which was an, an, an invitation uh, from Mariana Ibrahim Gallery in Chicago, 
and it was really, really a great opportunity to show um, the work of five great Brazilian artists, like um, uh, Aline Mota, Lu Martins, Eder Oliveira, Jaime Laureano and Thiago Santana. So four out of them were uh, present in Chicago uh, during the first days of the exhibition. So people could see Thiago's uh, uh, performance and could talk to the artists. And it was a beautiful bridge between um, American um, based in Chicago, uh, black critics, curators, artists, intellectuals uh, in contact with us Brazilians. So this kind of things is the things that we're doing. This is conversation. This is putting things in, in, in perspective that goes in both ways. So um, I really hope that you come to Brazil soon when it's possible. And I'm inviting you uh, in front of everybody. Let's work together, <laughs> Let's try to make it together. Because I think that this bridge between US and Brazil uh, must be even more uh, developed and constructed. And now it's the moment. So thank you very much for this invitation. I love it talking with you. Oh, no. It was, the pleasure was mine, and let's let's strengthen this bridge between yes. Brazil and the U.S. Oh, yes.